Good morning. Happy Easter. So some of you know this already, but what's the response when you hear Christ is risen? You say it's indeed. Okay, so when you hear that throughout the service, you guys know what to say. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to Dom's prelude. Amen. 
Amen. Christ is risen. So uh, welcome, it is good to be in worship together, both here in person and those of you joining us online. If you are joining us from home, grab something like bread and something like juice for communion later on in the worship service. Um, it is also the last day of Women's History Month. I usually try to do a children's message or something to mention these kinds of holidays, but I think it's pretty apt that we are celebrating uh, Women's History Month by listening to women tell the story of the resurrection, even if in Luke's gospel they're not believed at first. So thank God for the women at the tomb that first Easter morning. We also are celebrating UMCOR Sunday today. Um, UMCOR is a United Methodist Committee on Relief and um, they take up, we take up a special offering for them every, uh, every year, um, sometimes multiple times a year. And UMCOR does resurrection work. Uh, those of you who have been here on an UMCOR Sunday have heard me say, I'm Pastor Shannon, by the way, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> I should say that. Um, for those of you who have heard me talk about UMCOR before, um, one of my favorite stories was when we were serving in Bosnia, I, I went on a mission trip with UMCOR, and um, Bosnia is a country with a lot of different religions, but very few Protestant churches. There's Orthodox Christians and Catholic Christians and Muslims, and so when people asked us what faith we were, we were kind of like, well, we're Christians, but it's not really like the Orthodox or Catholic church. There are similarities, but... Our worship doesn't look quite the same. But I said, we are the church of UMCOR. And I remember telling a woman that once, and she said, oh, UMCOR, I know them. They help people. UMCOR is one of those relief organizations that's often the first into a place and the last out of a place. Um, so if you, have, uh, if you have any more questions about UMCOR, you can ask me. But um, especially for those of you who are visiting or who are new this morning, that might be something that you can consider uh, making an Easter gift to. We also know we need some of that resurrection work here, even at home in the wake of the Key Bridge collapse this week. So we want to pray for all those who loved the six who were lost and all those who are feeling, um, who are feeling lost in, in the wake of that devastation, even in our own community. So we come to God with a lot on our hearts, um, a lot of joy as well as sorrow. And throughout Lent, we have been wandering toward God with the disciple Simon Peter, and after this last week, we might expect that he denied Christ so he might cower in shame, maybe even run away. But instead, when he hears the good news from the women, he doesn't dismiss them like the other disciples. He gets up and runs to the tomb. When he peers in the empty tomb um, and sees a linen cloth, he is filled with awe. Even after the biggest failures, even after the worst case scenario has happened, can we run toward hope? Like Peter, will we keep going? Will we keep looking for God in our midst? These are the questions we ponder as we worship on this blessed Easter Sunday. Won't you stand in body or in spirit and join with me in our call to worship? Sometimes we believe that death has won. Sometimes we think all is lost. Sometimes we feel as though Christ ha is gone. But not today. Today we remember that love has won. Today we see how hope is real. Today we know that Christ is here. We have a reason to hope. We have a reason to sing. Alleluia. Christ is risen today. Let us sing. Oh, good. You guys are paying attention. Good. Let us sing our opening hymn, Lift High the Cross.
Amen. You may be seated. In the Gospel of Luke, the women come to the tomb, and to their surprise, instead of finding Jesus, they find angels. And the angels tell the women, Jesus is not here. And when that answer is met with confusion, the angels say, remember what he told you. Remember. It's one of the words Jesus, Jesus used at his last supper, and it's one of the words we hear at the empty tomb. Remember. This call to remember is why we need the prayer of confession and these words of forgiveness each week. It's not enough to hear God's grace once. We need to hear it over and over again, week after week. We need to be reminded that God's grace and mercy will never run out. So friends, let us run to God like the women ran to the tomb. Let us tell the truth of our lives so that once again, we may be reminded that our God is a God of grace, mercy, and love. Let us pray so we can remember. Join me in our prayer of confession. O oh God, even when we see the stone rolled away, we assume it is a mistake. Even when we hear the angels say, he is not here, we assume their news is fake. On this Easter morning, the women tell the story, but we do not always want to hear it. Peter runs to the tomb, but we do not often understand. Forgive us, God, for thinking an empty tomb is nothing more than a prank. Forgive us for seeing discarded burial cloths and still holding tight to death. Forgive us for pushing away reasons to hope when you are alive and well in the world. Teach us to see what you see. Unravel the threads of our unbelief. Amen. The angels told the women, remember what Jesus told you. So church, remember this. You are seen, you are forgiven, you are held in God's grace. All of this is true. Grace and mercy abound for us all. Remember this. Amen. Pastor John is going to lead us in the prayers of the people. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. A blessed Easter Sunday to everyone today. Today we join with many in the celebration of the resurrection. We put our faith and hope in the risen and living Lord Jesus, and we pause at this time for these prayers to be uplifted to his grace. And we remember what Psalm 4 speaks about. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. We had a joy that was mentioned for today, joy that Pop Pop Friel is joining us this morning for worship. So from one Pop Pop to another, welcome. <laughs> yes, my grandchildren call me Pop Pop too, so that's a joy. Any other joys that we might want to lift up today that anyone might have? Yes. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. Great. Anything else? Okay. <clears throat> and there was a concern shared by Mary Wallach that her cousins, Renee and Bridget, are having upcoming surgeries. And also a great nephew, Andrew, is also having surgery. So for all those who are facing upcoming surgeries, we certainly keep them in our thoughts and in our prayers prayers for the surgeons and the nurses and for a very quick healing from the surgeries that they'll be facing. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious and loving Lord God, your love and grace for your creation and for all of us is relentless and eternal. On this Easter Sunday, we sing praises for the wonders of that Easter dawn. He lives the love of God is triumphant over death. May the joy and strength of the resurrection bless all of our hearts and minds today. 
In the midst of our celebrations today, we also continue to pray persistently and hopefully for an ending of all war and suffering in the world. We pray for an ending to the violence in Israel and Gaza and the Ukraine and Russia and all the other wounded countries of the earth. We pray for wisdom for all the leaders as they seek together for a lasting peace. Gracious Lord, be with those who are grieving the death of loved ones. As we have journeyed in this Holy Week, we are reminded that Jesus experienced death and by God's grace also now lives in resurrection and life eternal. Bless the memories we all hold of our loved ones and help us to know and to experience the peace of heaven. We pray for all those who are struggling for renewed health and strength. Gracious and loving Lord Jesus, bless them all with Easter hope that can sustain their days of healing and enduring the pain on the way to that healing. Strengthen all those for whom we pray every day. May the hope of Easter bless all those affected by the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Abide, O risen Lord, with the families of those who died because of that collapse. Enfold them with your grace and mercy and comfort them by the power of the resurrection. Bless and protect all those rescue workers who put their lives in jeopardy to seek those lost in the water. Bless and guide all those who will now seek to rebuild and clear the shipping lane. Grant us all patience as the rebuilding begins. We pray, loving Lord, for the Easter hope we have now renewed on this day. May it remain strong and firm in our hearts forever. We give you thanks and praise for the precious gift of Easter. And now bless us as we listen to the words of Scripture, as we together relive that glorious, victorious day. Help us to hear these words as if for the first time. In the name of our risen and living Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is from the 118th Psalm. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness so that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson is from Luke chapter 24 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood between them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while, while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all, the, all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary and Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to their apostles, to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. A word of God that is still speaking. Nicole. Will my young friends come on up? So, Nicole, you can stay up here. Isn't it special? Let's sit up here. Isn't it a special day or something today? Yeah, yeah what's today? Easter. Easter. All right. Did anybody get an Easter basket or go on an egg hunt? My dad. My dad. Oh, your dad set up an Easter egg hunt. That's pretty cool. Some people might notice in their pews there are some Easter eggs around, and those are for you. So we had a few extras from last week, so we put those around. And some people, my favorite ones, um, put some up in the pulpit for me, too. And I think there were some for Dom in the organ, so thank you for those eggs. <clears throat> so what is your favorite thing to get in an Easter egg or in an Easter basket? What do you think is Henry's favorite thing in an Easter basket? Candy! Yeah! Um, I like to get candy in Easter baskets, too. What if Jesus was at your house this morning or when you went on an Easter egg hunt? Oh, Liam, yes. You like getting chocolate eggs. Me, too. Me too. That's my favorite. Chocolate's my favorite. You do, too. What else did you get in your Easter basket? Did you get cars? Whoa! Chocolate and snacks. Wow, that's awesome. So, you got a chocolate buddy? I love chocolate buddies, too. So, if Jesus was at your house with you getting an Easter basket this morning, what do you think Jesus would get in his Easter basket? I have some ideas. Okay. I think he'd get this. What's this? A potato? You guys get potatoes in your Easter baskets? No. No? Well, we had a really cool event here yesterday. Some of you might remember Pastor Mark. He's a pastor at Lewistown, but was an associate here for a while. And he um, uh, organizes a potato drop. How many pounds? 40,000 pounds of potatoes are brought here and distributed to people who are hungry. So that's a lot of potatoes. So uh, plenty for Easter baskets all over Frederick, right? No, it's, I think the reason why I wanted to share about the potato drop is because I think that is something that's, that shows our love for Jesus, right? When we can serve others and feed others, that's something that Jesus did, and that's something that we can do for others as well. So, um, so we have some p bags of potatoes downstairs in the NPR for anyone um, who wants to share some with a neighbor uh, or know somebody who could benefit. Um, how many pounds is the plastic bags? Does anyone know? 
10, about 10 pounds. Um, there are 10 pound plastic bags downstairs. So if you know some folks who could benefit from that, you are welcome to go down after the service. If you don't know where the NPR is, um, somebody can direct you. And we should probably have some next week too. But I do think there is something else Jesus would put in his Easter basket. So let me see. Let me see here. That he would like in his Easter basket. That maybe you guys would like better than potatoes. What are these? Peeps? So I think peeps are Jesus' favorite thing to put in an Easter basket. Do you know why? Because they're good. No, I don't think so. But okay. Because. I, I gave Nicole the, no, I didn't, because Jesus loves his peeps. Yeah. And where is peeps, right? So here, guys, you guys get uh, peeps, 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 peeps for everybody. I don't know if Henry can have peeps. Oh, that is a great idea. Then I'm going to give you um, Dr. Pepper. Yep. Okay. Ooh. Don't drop any on him. Yeah, so if you guys want to trade some, I'll put them over here so you can trade some. But let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the love that you had for us that we see in Jesus, um, for his great love for us, and for the way that you defeated death and that teach us to hope. Um, we ask that as we go forth from worship today, that we can go forth trying to love others even just a little bit as much as you love us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Yeah. And if you guys want to trade.
Let us pray. Patient teacher, you know our hopes and fears, you know all we stand in need of. As we explore scripture this morning, speak through the words of my mouth and the meditations of our own hearts and help us to understand the power of new life once more. Amen. The Easter can be a difficult day. You wouldn't always know it coming in here shouting, Christ is risen. I was waiting to see if you guys were paying attention, huh? You wouldn't necessarily know it with the beautiful flowers and triumphant music or with showering the children with marshmallow ridiculousness. Because when you have been through difficult seasons, and let's face it, uh, sometimes it is life itself that's difficult with maybe an easier season peppered in. Because when you have faced difficulty and death, disease and disappointment, it's hard to believe that good is possible, much less new life. I talked at the sunrise service about, uh, or I didn't mention this at the sunrise service, but I thought about how even turning on the news makes it seem clear new life is impossible, right? Coming to church to be positive and happy seems silly. The hope of Easter seems like a costume we put on for our worship and then take off again for our real world. Most of the men in the beginning of the Gospel of, John, uh, uh, Gospel of Luke's account of resurrection thought the same about hope. They called Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James's story of the empty tomb and the angel's message, an idle tale in the translation that was written, and nonsense in the one that Nicole read for us. Scholar and professor Caroline Lewis translates the Greek as garbage. These disciples thought that it was garbage to believe that Jesus Christ is resurrected. They might, not have, they might not have seen Jesus die as the women did, but they knew death was real and final, and they weren't going to delude themselves that Jesus' power could make a difference in this messed up world. But sometimes we want to cling to even garbage stories. Sometimes such stories are all we have against the abyss of despair. Many of you have heard the Emily Dickinson poem about hope being a thing with feathers. But I like this image from a guy named Matthew with the handle Crow's Fault. People speak of hope as if it is this delicate, ephemeral thing made of whispers and spider webs. But it's not. Hope has dirt on her face, blood on her knuckles, and the grit of cobblestones in her hair, and just spat out a tooth as she rises for another go. Peter had the kind of hope with dirt on his face when he heard the women's story. He might not have been convinced Jesus was not dead, but he didn't want to live in a world where his teacher and Lord was gone. He couldn't quite believe the women, but he was willing to go and see the tomb. In fact, he ran to it. Throughout the season of Lent, the season of 40 days, not including Sundays, that leads us right to Easter, we wandered with the disciple Peter. He's one of the disciples we know the most about, one that many of us identify with, and yet we don't often read his story in order to see the shape of the journey. We expect faith journeys to move us ever closer, steadily closer to God. But if you pay attention to the story of Jesus' death even, you see that Peter even with his awe of, at Jesus' power, even with his certainty that Jesus is the Messiah, even with his openness to learn, he does not spend Holy Week moving closer to God. He struggles not only with the violence around him and the fear that he had for his friend, but also with his own disappointment in himself. A sanctified arts commentary explains, Peter drew his sword. Peter denied Christ three times. Peter was not there when Jesus died. And, and, see, we can struggle. We can disappoint. We can betray and deny. We can be victims. And, remember, Peter was also the one who ran to the tomb after hearing the story the rest of the disciples wrote up off as garbage. 
Peter shows us that we can always begin again. We can add an and when we think our stories have come to an end. Dr. Caroline Lewis writes that she imagines Peter asking himself, could it really be true? With hope on his heels as he ran to the tomb to see for himself. And then Peter goes home wondering, and it's in the wondering that the meaning of the resurrection lies. The resurrection only makes sense when we remain amazed, marveling and wondering at the love of God that reversed death itself. We're not asked to explain the resurrection, offer proof for resurrection, make a case for resurrection. Instead, like Peter, we live in wonder for how belief in the God of resurrection truly can change us and even the world. The promise of Easter is not this enthusiastic positivity that we often get caught up in in our worship. The promise of Easter isn't even some factual explanation, some proof we are offering to the world that we are right and Jesus is indeed the Messiah. The promise of Easter is this deep, tricky, messy hope that we can always begin again. So where do you need to begin again in your life, in your relationships? Where has your hope faded and perhaps could be taken up again, not in positivity, but as a discipline to see where new possibilities for life might be opening up? Where can you find wonder and love no matter how ridiculous it might seem? The thing about hope as Peter hoped is that it isn't about anticipating. You can't predict what is going to happen Uh, You can't make sure that you are always drawing closer to God without ever faltering, but you can participate in hope. You can be unsure of what it means and still run toward hope. Like Peter did that first Easter morning when he heard a strange and confusing nonsense tale from Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. It might have been weird, but he chose to run toward good news and see for himself. My prayer is that we also choose to run towards hope, to participate in hope this day and every day. I invite you to consider how you can better live into hope in the ways you love, in the ways you give, and in the ways you serve in this time of offering as we hear the brass play, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Amen. Won't you stand in body or in spirit, join with me as we pray and sing over the offering. Let us pray. God of new beginnings, on that first Easter morning, the disciples struggled to hear the good news, and sometimes we do too. Open up our minds that the mystery and joy of Easter might feel within reach. God of the empty tomb, use the gifts of our talent, time, and treasure to augment the sound of alleluias ringing in this world. Help us to know that the story is not over yet, for you are among us, guiding us to join in the telling. With hope and joy in our hearts, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Will my confirmand helpers... Prepare yourselves by waiting by a Yeah. You'll be green, Lindsay. <laughs> As we begin the communion liturgy, I wanted to invite you to this table. When the women got to the tomb on that Easter morning, they were met by angels who told them he is not here, but remember what he told you. I can't help but wonder, as the sun rose over the trees, if they remembered it all. Wonder if they remember Jesus telling the 5,000 people to sit together in the grass, passing out baskets of fish and bread. I wonder if they remembered how he stopped in the middle of the crowd to ask who touched my robe? I wonder if they remembered how he ate with Zacchaeus or scooped up the children um, and saying, let them come to me. I wonder if they remembered him teaching in the temple, telling people, love your neighbor as yourself. I wonder if they remembered how the wind stopped with the sound of his voice. I wonder if they remembered how, they, how he washed their feet and said, this is my body broken for you. I wonder if they remembered it all. Friends, just like the women in the garden, we need those same rem reminders. The suffering of the world can erode the muscle memory of grace and welcome that we hold. So don't let it. Come to the table and remember. Remember how Jesus fed everyone. Remember how none were turned away. Remember how he said, do this in remembrance of me. Come and remember, there is room for you here. As we prepare this table, the confirmands will be praying over this meal with me. So you guys can stand at the microphone. Need your... You're green, and you are blue. Okay, you're red. Okay. God of today and tomorrow. God of the garden and the tomb. God of our faith and our doubt. 
We are running toward you. Like Peter on that Easter morning, we simply cannot stay away. With beating hot hearts and wide eyes, we have arrived in this sanctuary today, bringing our whole selves, asking for your love. God of the dawn, you meet us in our hopes. Thank you for the gifts of this world that instill buoyancy in us. Thank you for the curiosity of children, for the sound of your people singing in unison, for crowded tables and neighborly kindness, for the sun after the rain, the spring after the frost, love after lost, and faith after doubt. Like Peter, we have countless reasons to hold on to hope. Highest among them is the joy and promise of this day. Thank you for these holy breadcrumbs on the journey of faith. However, before we found ourselves in the garden, before the joy and the alleluias of this day, we found ourselves at the foot of the cross. So for the things that erode our hope, for the things that stitch doubt and fear into our hearts, we ask for your comforting hand. As we come to the table today, may we feel your arms wrapped around all who are still locked in that upper room. Wrap your arms around all who cannot find healing after their longest night. Wrap your arms around all who look for reasons to hope, but cannot find those breadcrumbs amidst reasons to grieve. Holy God, like Peter, fan the flames of our faith. Like Peter, invite us to step out of our boats. And like Peter, use us to care for those in need, to tell your story, and to build a better world. We remember and we believe. So with awestruck, wildly beating, grateful hearts, we run toward you. We ran toward you and you met us around countless tables, not least of which was on the night before your betrayal and death. You gathered those you loved around you, took bread, broke it, and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And when the supper was over, you took the cup, gave, again gave thanks, and gave it to us saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And eat and drink and remember me. My friends, remember there is room for us here. Let us continue our prayer. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and from the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table is set and all are invited. If you guys want to go, there's um, a hand sanitizer down at the, you guys can sanitize your hands. We are going to be taking communion by intinction, which means you'll get a piece of the bread and you can dip it in the cup. Um, if you're not comfortable with intinction or if you need a gluten-free option, um, I will have these, um, uh, these, prepackaged elements here as well. In the United Methodist Church, you don't have to take classes. Um, you don't have to be feeling a particular way this morning. Even if you're still a little hungry um, and really want a donut, you are still welcome to come to this table and to catch a taste of grace. Uh, so as we sing, uh, you are invited to stand as you are able. And as we sing, you're welcome to come forward. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. 
Now we have eaten and we continue our celebration in song. Won't you stand in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn? That's next, right? Yes, okay. forth from this place, go in hope, sharing hope, participating in hope. Go to serve your neighbor and go telling the story. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>